Hey, what's up guys? Captain Zach here. Well, we are one week away from the King Salmon opener here in Juneau, and I am absolutely pumped. I can't wait. I'm starting to shake the gear down and get a game plan together. Uh, but before we kick the season off next week and start to really get after it, I thought I'd take a few moments and, and put together kind of a salmon tips video. So I know I get a lot of questions and comments on the, on the channel about sort of what, what gear I'm using or what techniques I'm using. And I do try to sprinkle some of that guidance in, you know, into the individual videos. But I thought it might be useful to sort of package it all up into, uh, into one cohesive video, which is hopefully the aim of, of this. And I know folks over the years have been really generous with me, giving me tips and guidance. And I know it's made a big difference just in terms of my, my catch rate and just overall confidence. So I'm sort of hoping to pay, pay it forward a little bit here and kind of put together a set of tips. And hopefully it'll help you guys catch a few more salmon. Uh, hey, before we get started, I have to give a plug for this month's issue of Fish Alaska Magazine, uh, May 2023. You might recognize that guy right there. Uh, big, big thanks to Connor and the Fish Alaska team. We put together an article called The Kings of Southeast. So I had a lot of inputs and we got some inputs from some other really great experienced fishermen. And I think put together a really nice set of tips uh, focused on really trolling and casting in Southeast Alaska. So there's a really good set of guidance there. Definitely worth checking out. Hey, one more general comment before I dive in. I'm going to aim to be as detailed and specific as possible. Uh, so I'm not claiming that this is the only way to do things. I'm also not claiming that this is the best way of doing things. I'm just saying this is sort of how I do it. Uh, and I have caught, you know, thousands of salmon over the last maybe 15 years or so in Southeast Alaska, uh, primarily trolling, but also some casting as well. So I'll pick up a couple of those types of tips along the way. Uh, but this is by no means meant to be some kind of silver bullet. These are just some tips coming from one person who has some decent amount of experience. And I hope you kind of add what I say to what you're hearing from others, from your personal experience, put it all together and figure out what works best for you. Well, I'll start with an overview of the five different types of salmon that show up in Southeast Alaska. The kings are the first salmon to show up in Southeast every year, and they are the absolute prize. So they're the biggest of the five Pacific salmon. Uh, they're also known as Chinook salmon, and they'll weigh in anywhere from uh, 15 to 30 pounds on average, but they certainly get much bigger than that. I know just a couple of years ago, I got a nice 43, and every year there's some really, really nice ones caught. But one sort of nuance about this fishery, there are three different distinct runs to consider. So sometimes people just assume king salmon fishing is king salmon fishing, but the runs and the timing do, uh, they do matter. The first run of kings is the natural run. So this occurs in May, and this is where natural kings are going back to the, uh, the creeks, the streams and rivers that they came from. And so the fishing game is doing everything they can to protect those natural kings. So they, in recent years and probably for the foreseeable future, uh, that fishery will be closed to sport fishing, uh, which is really important to understand that. Since anglers can't target those natural fish that are coming back in May, the terminal fishery, the uh, hatchery fishery becomes really desirable. The second run of kings is the terminal or hatchery run. So this is a really desirable run of kings for sport fishing anglers. So these fish are returning to a hatchery or they're returning to sort of where they've imprinted. So hatcheries will take salmon fry and they'll put pens of them out in certain areas. Those little fry will imprint and then they'll return right to that area. So this tends to peak in the uh, June timeframe around Juneau. So that's when the, the terminal fishery is really at its finest and open for fishing. It can occur slightly different times throughout Southeast. So check the local regulations, but this is definitely a fishery that sport fishing anglers are interested in. And then the third run of kings to consider are actually feeder kings. So the first two categories I mentioned, those fish are making their final stand. They're coming back for the end of their life. Uh, feeder kings, on the other hand, are actually just king salmon that have worked their way into the southeast Alaska waters. They're feeding on uh, herring and other bait fish, and they're actually going to be going back out into the ocean. But those feeder kings are in during the summer, so June, July, August, uh, a great time to catch those feeder kings. On average, they're not going to be quite as big as those terminal kings because they still have some growing up to do, but they can be a great uh, king to target and a lot of locals will target them. There are pretty strict regulations for non-residents on those, on those feeder kings. Sometimes there's an annual limit of only like one or two, whereas the uh, terminal limits tend to be much more generous. So definitely check those regulations. So surprisingly enough, identifying a king salmon can actually be a little bit tricky. So if you're catching a terminal or a hatchery fish, that's pretty simple. So based on the time of year, the cohos aren't even here yet, uh, and the size of those fish, 
you're gonna know that's a king. But those feeder kings I mentioned, they run a little bit later. And so they're often identifying the difference between a coho and a feeder king can be a little bit tricky. There's three specific things I look for. The first is the tail. Right when I catch one, I'll look at the tail and a king salmon will have dots on both lobes of the tail. So it'll have dots on the top and the bottom, whereas a coho will only have dots typically on the top lobe. Then I go to the mouth. So a king salmon will have black gums, whereas a coho will actually have white gums. They'll both have a darker tongue. So the tongue doesn't give it away, it's the gums. So you gotta really look at the gums. But the last tell, and, and this is the one that I think is actually the most explanatory and I don't hear a lot of people talking about it. It's actually the teeth. So if you look at the, the teeth on a feeder king, they look like little razor blades. They are so sharp and they're far and away different than a coho. So if, if the teeth look like little razor blades and they're super sharp and you've got dots on both lobes of the tail and you've got that, that black gum line, you know you've got a feeder king. The next most sought after salmon is definitely the cohos. This is also known as a silver salmon. These fish are gonna average anywhere from, call it eight to 12 pounds or so. Uh, the coho show up probably mid-July through August. It really gets good. Um, I usually catch my first coho sometime early July. There's usually a few stragglers. So that 4th of July weekend is always a, a fun time to try to target cohos. But these fish are a blast. I mean, they are energetic. They're silver bullets. They're jumping left and right. They hit really hard. They are just a really fun fish to catch. Cohos make great table fare as well. So they're delicious to eat. They're amazing smoked. And also anglers often target them just because they're also a little more willing to bite. So you can really stack up some cohos. It can be kind of an action packed session. Whereas when you're fishing for kings, sometimes it can be kind of a low and slow grind. So if you're really trying to stack fillets, sometimes coho is exactly where it's at. And as I mentioned earlier, the telltale signs of a coho, you're gonna have spots typically on just the top lobe of the tail. And then also it'll have that white gum line. Those are two good tells to know you've got a coho. Pink salmon show up in Southeast during the July, August timeframe. Uh, these are also known as humpies. And the reason they're called humpies is because in their later spawn cycles, they get this really pronounced hump on the top of their back. Uh, but they're in that like three to five pound range. And they're a lot of fun to catch. So they're really eager to bite. So they'll take a variety of different baits. They're a pretty fun battle. Uh, in terms of table fare, I would say they're not quite as good as coho or king. However, uh, some people do enjoy eating them. I know they smoke up real nice, so you can, the meat can tend to be a little bit mushier, but then if you, if you smoke it and get a good brine and pellicle, then it kind of mitigates the fact that it's a little bit softer meat and it can still taste really delicious. Identifying a pink is usually pretty straightforward. So if you see that big hump on the back, that's a telltale sign. Uh, but also the, the pinks will have these sort of large oval splotches all across their back. They'll also have kind of a greenish hue. So it'll almost, it'll have a greenish hue. You'll see these sort of uh, purplish uh, splotches all down the back, but then also both lobes of the tail will have those splotches as well. The sockeye salmon show up in Southeast in July. Uh, these are also called red salmon and they are absolutely delicious, but they're very tricky to catch. So these, these fish will weigh on average anywhere from like four to eight, four to 10 pounds. But whereas all of the other salmon will actually bite your bait because they're either hungry or it's an aggression strike, the sockeyes uh, are actually, they'll only eat plankton. So they're not really biting at your bait. Um, so most sockeyes are caught either commercially uh, or there's in some regulations, you're able to either dip net for them or cast net for them. And then there are some freshwater tactics where you can kind of like basically snag them in the mouth. So you're flossing them, uh, but they're tricky to catch with, uh, with sport fishing gear for the average Southeast Alaskan fisherman. If you do happen to catch a sockeye, the way to identify it is, you know, if it's in the salt water, it's actually the distinct lack of spots. So that tail will have absolutely no dots on it. Uh, and then if it's in the fresh water, like later on in the spawn cycle, it's why they call it a red salmon. It'll get a really bright red hue. And last but certainly not least, the chum salmon or the dog salmon as they're called. These will show up kind of late June, all the way through August. And they're a really fun fish to catch. They're gonna average in that like seven to 15 pound range. They're usually really eager to bite. Uh, they're a great fight. I would say they're a little lacking on the table fare, to be honest, but uh, it's always amazing to catch an Alaskan salmon and uh, fun to get a chum on the line. And the two tells for identifying a chum salmon, 
One will be its teeth. It'll have these big sharp teeth, these large canines. Uh, and the second one is what I call sort of tiger stripes. So it'll have these vertical stripes going down the, the side. And, and it's the only one of the five salmon that'll have those types of stripes. In the, uh, in the salt water, those markings will be a little more faint, but in the, in the fresh water towards some of the later spawn cycles, uh, those teeth just start to become absolutely ferocious and the stripes are just unmistakable. So it'll look, uh, you'll have to look a little harder for it in the salt water, but by the time those fish are later in the spawn cycle, uh, it's a really freakish looking thing. So overall, if you ask me what's my favorite salmon to fish for, I'll say, of course, it depends. It depends what time of year. So, you know, I love starting the season off that early season fishing for kings. That's a challenging fishery, but just a total blast. You know, by mid season, uh, I'm definitely targeting those cohos. Mid to late season, it's all about the cohos for me. Uh, honestly, I, I, I never really target the pinks or the chums, but when I do catch them as bycatch, it's always a blast. I'm happy to catch them. Most of the time that's a catch and release or I'll keep those as a uh, halibut bait actually. In terms of table fare, at risk of sounding like a salmon snob, uh, anytime I eat whole meat salmon, it's often king salmon. That is my absolute favorite fish to prepare uh, fresh. The rich oils, uh, the wonderful flavor that you get out of a fresh king salmon, in my opinion, is absolutely second to none. Uh, the cohos are really good as well, but I tend to smoke a bunch of cohos in the fall. Uh, and then anytime I get a sockeye, of course, that rich red meat is good, either smoked or, uh, or whole meat as well. I will say with the kings, in addition to just eating them fresh and, and whole meat, uh, they also smoke wonderfully, especially white kings. So white kings are actually fairly rare. Uh, they tend to be about one in 20. However, we do end up getting a decent amount of those here in the Juno area. So every year I, I tend to get a white king or two, uh, which is awesome. And those smoke up really well. So anytime I get a white king, I know that's heading right for the smoker. Well, now that we know a little more about the five different salmon, let's talk about how to catch them. You know, broadly speaking, my uh, philosophy around fishing, including salmon fishing, but also halibut fishing, it can really be broken down into to three different areas. So it's a, it's a premium spot plus premium bait plus a premium tide. And, and so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about each of those in turn. The premium spot will be all around the, you know, the spot dynamics, spot selection, big picture, minute details. The, uh, the premium bait, it's all about really paying attention to the subtle details and some of the different options you've got to give different presentation styles. Uh, and then the importance of tide. In Southeast Alaska, the tides are, are significant. So really kind of better understanding, you know, when and where to take advantage of those. So for me, there's two aspects when I think about a premium salmon spot. It's the, the macro spot and the micro spot. So the macro spot is all about kind of figuring out big picture, where's that boat going to be positioned, where are you going to troll at general area? And then the micro spot is more about making sort of subtle micro adjustments based on the dynamics you're observing at that moment. So the first tip about a macro spot is really uh, focused on king salmon, and it's the idea of don't overthink it. I mentioned the terminal, the uh, hatchery fisheries, you know, and the importance of checking regulations. Well, those regulations publish exactly where the terminal areas are, including with boundary markers. The fishing game wants you to catch these fish. So like those fish are coming back, they're imprinted to either a specific hatchery or that specific area. So as you're checking the regulations, look at the maps that the Alaska Fishing Game publishes. They will tell you exactly where these fish are scheduled to show up. So go fish for them there. So if you're thinking about those kind of uh, kings in the terminal fishery, that's usually around the June timeframe in Southeast. Definitely start by figuring out where they're expected to show up and Alaska Fishing Game will tell you that exactly. Now, by midsummer, when you're targeting the feeder kings or cohos, you know, that's when you need to start putting the thinking cap on in terms of spot dynamics. You know, and so I'm not going to name any spots specifically, but generally speaking, uh, this, these are kind of the attributes I think about when I'm targeting some good salmon spots. So mainland points tend to be a really good salmon spot. So that is really whether it's sort of the actual mainland or whether it's a large point that's formed by by an island. There's tons of islands in Southeast Alaska, so you'll find a lot of these sort of sharp point features. Uh, salmon are often working their way sort of around those, so it's definitely a likely spot to target. 
Underwater pinnacles and mounds are another really good salmon spot. So this is where you've got sort of deep water in the area, and then it comes up to sort of a shallow either mound, which I consider kind of a broad or flatter mound, or a pinnacle, which is more of a sharp fixture. Uh, either way, these create good feeding dynamics, so some good ambush opportunities for salmon that are, that are targeting herring. So those are always worth, uh, worth a look. The mouth of bays is another good spot to consider for, for salmon fishing. Uh, often there's sort of bait fish back in the bay that could potentially get swept out with the tide, so it creates a good feeding opportunity. And there's also a chance that those salmon are actually returning to a stream or river that is actually at the head of that bay. So there's a couple of different dynamics why right at the mouth can be a really awesome salmon trolling spot. And another spot to consider is really the mouth of a stream or a river. I like to call this sort of an estuary area, and that's where these salmon are returning to. And often there's some really good uh, saltwater trolling to be had just outside of there. I mentioned Southeast Alaska has a lot of islands. You know, one other really favorable dynamic that I like to look for are smaller islands that are near any of the larger features that I just mentioned. So where the larger features I mentioned sort of define the spot more structurally, if there are some smaller islands in play, those can create really favorable uh, feeding dynamics. So it's a good sort of ambush spot for salmon to be eating herring. So one more thought about the macro spot. You know, you might say, well, hey, thanks, Zach. You just described three quarters of Southeast Alaska by those different features. And you know what, I think that's, that's fair. There are a lot of really attractive spots throughout, throughout Southeast. So you gotta sort of whittle it down some way. And, and a couple of the criteria I like to use uh, is really thinking about the salmon migration path. So thinking about where they're gonna be traveling from and to. So they are gonna be coming from the open ocean. There's no doubt about that. And so really understanding kind of where sort of the larger bodies of water are and how the salmon would be traveling through those, it will naturally have the salmon sort of running, running across certain larger bodies of water and running into other uh, either islands or mainlands. So when I talk about kind of mainland points, really understanding kind of where those salmon will be, be, be converging is, 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 is key. But then also understanding where they're going. They are going to, you know, in some cases, these hatchery systems, but in other cases, these natural rivers and streams. And so kind of by putting those two together, understanding where the natural inflows are from the open ocean and where some of the natural destinations are, those, those rivers and streams or hatchery areas, uh, by putting all that together, and then understanding kind of the you know unique types of spot dynamics I just mentioned that can be a really good starting point for a good macro spot. Hey one other thing to consider when selecting a macro spot the uh, Alaska Fish and Game just recently launched an interactive uh, map of Southeast Alaska that has a lot of great spots just marked. So this is both for halibut and salmon. Um, it's a really nice tool. It's an interactive map, as I said, so you can scroll all through Southeast Alaska, depending on where you're trying to fish. And it will give, you know, some known salmon and halibut spots. And it also sort of marks everything in the context of specific island names or bodies of water. So it's very relatable. It's easy to kind of understand exactly what it's trying to, to point at. So in addition, to what I mentioned there, you might also consider this interactive resource right at your fingertips for a good starting point for some likely spots. I'll toss a link to that interactive map from Alaska Fish and Game in the details of this video. Some say the devil's in the details, and you know what? That's exactly right. Getting the little things right can make a big difference. So let's talk about some of those micro spot dynamics. So first, let's clarify the point of making micro adjustments, and it's just that. It's adjustments. It's making subtle changes based on the information that you have, which hopefully you're getting more and more information as you stay at a spot longer and longer. It's making changes to slightly tip the odds in your favor. So this is all a probability game. And, and any given day, anyone can catch a fish doing almost anything. But if you play it out over thousands of hours of trolling, uh, there are ways to kind of subtly tip the odds in your favor. So any of these adjustments are intended to be just that, slight changes so that you can kind of get, incorporate more and more information and give yourself slightly better probabilities of a hookup. So the first thing I'm always keeping an eye out for are bait balls. So it's absolutely no secret, salmon love herring. And whenever you're at a spot and there's a lot of herring, often that's a really good sign because the salmon can be in the area. In some cases, you'll actually be marking the salmon. So you can see the bait balls and the, uh, and, and the salmon just underneath usually. They show up as sort of check marks. That being said, 
like pay attention to that. Pay attention to how thick the bait is, where the bait balls are, how deep the bait balls are, and then adjust your rods accordingly. So like, it doesn't make any sense at all to keep trolling in, I don't know, 20 or 30 feet. If you see a ton of bait down at 50 or 60 feet and you're getting marks left, right, and center. So always be sort of understanding, is there bait in the area? If so, how can you kind of target that bait? Get your baits closer to that, that depth range, and then also work your way around it. So rather than just sort of trolling into the ether and just sort of hoping you eventually find a salmon, if you do find there are some school of bait, if there's bait balls, work your way through it again and again, sort of figure eight your way back through it so that you're giving yourself a better and better shot at encountering a salmon. Another thing to consider is, you know, you want to spend disproportionately more time in what I would consider advantage spots. So within a spot that you're at, if there's a point, if there's a sudden depth change, if there's a mound or a pinnacle, you do want to kind of target those more systematically. And then also just really testing the breadth of the depth range as well. So don't just sort of leave a rod at ex exactly, you know, 40 feet, let's say, um, for five hours straight. Like, why not be testing a variety of different depth ranges just to see if you can kind of trigger a strike? Of course, informed by if you're seeing uh, any kind of, you know, bait on the, on the finder. And then also, if you're getting any strikes, it's really key to pay attention to if you're getting strikes, sort of start to do more of that. You, you know, two strikes is better than one. So one is always, could always be a fluke. If you start to pick up two strikes in a certain depth range, that's starting to feel like a pattern and so on and so forth. But really pay attention, you know, even if you don't land a fish, even if you, something stole your herring as an example, or you thought it, you might have had a takedown, pay attention to that. If you think it was a strike, that's a piece of data that you can incorporate into spending more time trolling in a higher probability area. And one other micro spot tip that might seem a little obvious, but it's worth saying, look for jumpers. So often salmon will jump. Um, this happens with kings, it happens with cohos, you know, pinks will jump all around too. Uh, but that, it's telling you where they are. So I'm not saying you're going to catch that exact fish, but there's likely sort of more than just that fish in the area. So pay attention to that. You know, if you see some jumpers, work your way over there and make sure you're doing some trolling passes through there. You might also look for sea lions or orcas in the area. Now this can be a double-edged sword, so I'm not saying there's a super clear takeaway. Um, sometimes if those are in the area, the salmon will get spooked and the bite will turn off. You know, those salmon are just running for their lives, so they're not interested in biting your herring. Uh, but, but at the same time, sometimes they're there because there's a ton of salmon in the area. So I have, I have had it be the case where, you know, if, if you see some orcas around or, or even some sea lions, uh, that you are able to still get some good hookups, probably because of just the sheer number of salmon in the area. Okay, so now we've got a good idea about how to find a premium spot. Let's start talking about the premium bait that you want to run at that spot. I do want to mention that I will show some specific gear, including specific brands. But my only motivation for that is the fact that this is what I've selected uh, and purchased with my own money, which I believe gives me sort of the best chance of, of catching fish. So at the time of this recording, uh, I am currently not sponsored and have no other sort of motivations about the specific gear that I'm showing you other than it just happens to be what I'm using. I've purchased myself and I'm out there catching fish with it. While there's probably an endless combination of things you could troll, like plugs, spoons, flies, I'm gonna focus on two, what I believe are sort of the most popular tactics in Southeast, herring and hoochies. Someone told me one time, everything in the ocean eats a herring. And you know what? That's pretty much true. And I know salmon love herring. So when I'm trolling a herring, I'm typically trolling it behind a flasher, an 11 inch flasher, which I'll show you some of the different color patterns and some of the nuance with that flasher. But one of the first things I think about when I'm, when I'm getting ready to fish a herring is what size. So I know fly fishermen might be used to the term match the hatch. So you're really trying to kind of match the exact bait or in, in that case, the, the hatch that's on the stream. Uh, same type of thing applies here. So based on the different spots, the different time of year, there's not one size fits all for herring. And so they do have these sort of trays of herring in different sizes. And so I often will have multiple sizes of herring on board. Uh, these are these smaller herring, they're green labels. So you can see there's uh, 12 per tray, so much smaller. Then I'd call it kind of a medium size, which is a, a blue label herring. I love blue labels. So, you know, there's uh, eight per piece in this pack. I caught my 43 pound king on a blue label herring. And then there's these real monsters. There's only six of them in this whole pack, but these purple labels, they're huge. 
And so, you know, there's not a one size fits all there, honestly. So sometimes I'll be out trolling for kings. I'll start with big herring, not get a bite at all, switch it up, go back down to like a green label or something and bam, trigger a strike. Uh, same with the cohos. Sometimes they'll, they'll eat these little ones all day long. Uh, but then sometimes I'll actually uh, t crank it up to a bigger, a purple label if I'm looking for a bigger bite, just give it a little higher profile bait. So always have a couple of different size herring available. Sometimes that can really uh, make all the difference. So in addition to different sizes of herring, one thing I like to do is actually have multiple colors of herring. I use a liquid brine and it actually accomplishes two things. One, if I want, it'll give it a really nice color. And secondarily, that brine will actually firm up the herring such that when they're trolling, it's a more firm bait, they're less soggy, they'll last longer, they're less likely to tear, etc. So, you know, I use a liquid brine, like here's, uh, here's Fire Brine by Polskis. You'll see this is blue. So you'll, I will go out and troll blue herring and sometimes have like outsized success on a blue herring versus a, a standard color herring. I've got a bottle of green here as well. So again, king salmon especially really love green. So that's always a, a, a good color. And then also uh, just sort of a clear brine. So if you just want to use a basic herring, a clear brine is also a good choice. Again, it'll kind of firm up that fish. It'll even make it a little shinier uh, such that it'll troll much better for you. The process of brining a herring is uh, one that's hotly contested. So there's a lot of opinions out there about exactly the perfect way to brine a herring, some more scientific than others. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say, honestly, mine is a very simple approach. So. Uh, it just happens to be the way I do it. I'm not saying you have to do it this way. However, I found that it's kind of simple and practical. So what I do is I take a tray or two of frozen herring. I'll put that in a, a gallon freezer Ziploc bag. So like a really heavy duty bag and then cover it up with, with that liquid brine, the brine that I showed you here. So that's usually about like a half bottle or so. Make sure that the herring are covered up. I toss that bag in my uh, bait cooler and we're ready to go. So then I go fishing. Usually I'll sit a, maybe a bait or two out on my, uh, on my mat just to get it to thaw a little bit, just enough to kind of clip it on to the herring clips that I like to use that I'll show in a minute. Uh, and then whenever I'm done at the end of the day, those baits are still pretty frozen because they're in that bag. What I'll do is I'll just take that bag and put it right back in the freezer. So the brine actually never freezes itself and those baits stay nice and fresh and they're always ready just for the next outing. Works out great and it's pretty simple. So there's two popular options for trolling herring and getting it to spin. One is a herring clip, so a head that goes on it that'll actually make it turn, and the other is a cut plug, so physically cutting the herring such that there's an angle that it'll turn. So as you've probably seen in some of my videos, you'll probably know that I prefer these herring clips. So these are clips that'll kind of pinch on to the front of the herring and force it to spin, uh, as opposed to a cut plug. And the reason I really like these, it's because you know you're fishing. So you know that that herring is spinning consistently really well. And then one of the challenges or a downside of a cut plug is that, you know, if, if the spin isn't perfect, there's a chance that you're dragging your bait through and not necessarily fishing really effectively. So let's talk a little more about these herring clips. If you've seen my previous videos, you'll know that this is my preferred method for trolling for salmon. And I'll tell you why. It's all about the consistency you know that your bait is fishing. You know that the, the spin on that herring is gonna be perfect. And here's how it accomplishes that. So you'll see it's kind of a triangle shape, but we've got these aggressive teeth there. So what you do is you put the nose of the herring right into those teeth, and then you pinch it down. And you'll see there's a metal clamp right here. That metal clamp just locks it into place. And it's adjustable and it can lock in at a couple different levels. So herring have different size noses. I just mentioned the importance of like, using green label, blue label, purple label, depending on those different situations. So no two herring are the exact same. So it does offer that flexibility. But once you lock it into place, that herring is not going anywhere. Um, and then every so often you'll get a strike and what you'll do is you pull up and you might be left with just the nose, but the herring's not gonna fall out of there. And then what you have here is sort of this uh, fin. That's what really drives the, the motion. And so that's what drives the circular motion again, with just remarkable consistency. So knowing that these teeth are not gonna give way, that herring's always gonna stay connected, unless a fish comes like a king or a coho and literally rips off the rest of the herring. But just in the normal course of trolling, that herring's not gonna fall off and that herring's gonna spin perfectly. That is a really good outcome. So I get a lot of questions about what model roto chip I use. 
Uh, they have two primary sizes, 5A and 5B. 5A is a smaller size, which is in this hand, and 5B is a larger size, which is in this hand. You can see the difference. This has a larger fin on it. Uh, this is intended, 5A, the smaller one, is intended for smaller baits in the four to five inch range, whereas, whereas this one is actually intended for larger baits in the six to seven inch range. So this will have more of a fin to be able to kind of spin a larger bait, whereas the smaller profile of this is designed to spin a smaller bait. Now, all that being said, feel free to experiment. I certainly do. So I can tell you, I've caught king salmon trolling green label herring, the small herring, on this bigger clip. And I also caught my 43 pound king on a blue label herring with this smaller clip. So it's not, they're not hard, fast rules. So sometimes I like a big herring in this small clip because kings tend to like it slow and wide. So that really sort of slow wobble that this gives on a larger herring can be attractive. Uh, and also the whip that this one will give to a smaller herring can be attractive as well. So again, you've got all these different variables to play with. Just always be sort of testing different things and learning and putting more data points into play. And it's also worth noting these clips come in a variety of colors. So this is sort of a green chartreuse, but I'll often use a clear. I mentioned kings love green. I'll talk about colors more specifically in a little bit. Uh, and then here's sort of a red, orangish color. So again, switching up various combinations of different variables can sometimes trigger a strike. Uh, here we are all rigged up. So there's the, the 5B model, the bigger one, sort of in line on a two hook rig. This is 30 pound test, uh, sort of a slider hook rig. I'll show you another version that I tie myself in a second. Uh, but, but as you've heard me mention before on some videos, that back hook will be at the back of the herring, like right at the back of the tail, just kind of free swinging. Uh, and both of these hooks will free swing. So there's not a hook in the herring. These, these hooks will go beside the herring. But I'll run this about four or five feet behind an 11 inch flasher. So I usually do sort of an arm's length. You can see I stretch my arms out and it's exactly that far. Uh, that tends to work really well when you're running a herring. Uh, and it's important that you recognize that you run a herring farther back than you would a hoochie. So the hoochie, and I'll explain more about that later, but you're gonna have a shorter distance there because you're really trying to whip it around. With this, with this herring though, the herring's the star of the show. You, the, the flasher doesn't need to do anything um, to sort of convince the salmon that this is gonna be a herring. The herring is gonna do all the work. The flasher is really just gonna give it that nice wide roll. So the flasher will whip it around and kings love like a wide, slow wobble. So as the flasher whips it around, then the, uh, the herring clip will be spinning and that herring will just be fluttering perfectly, just waiting for that big salmon to come up and bite it. Hey, I mentioned a cut plug herring earlier. Well, this is how you create one. This is called a miter box. And what, what you do is you kind of lay the herring down in it and you'll cut the head off the herring, but you'll do it at a certain angle. So it has these little grooves that allow your knife to follow the exact angle. And there, there's two different versions. One is for king and the other is for coho. So it says king, the head should go this way. So there's an arrow for king this way. And then there's coho and an arrow that way. So hypothetically, I'll grab a herring and I'll make it for a king salmon since the season will open up next week. So what I'll do is I'll put the, the herring head face that way, use a very sharp knife, and then slice the head off at that exact angle. And the reason it has two separate angles, a king likes a wider, slower wobble, and then a coho likes a tighter, faster spin. So basically this box will do the, do the hard work for you in terms of getting the angle correct. All you have to do is sort of follow the right direction and make sure you've got a really sharp knife. Now, when you cut open these trays of herring, make sure you don't cut into the actual fish itself. So it makes no sense to buy high quality bait and then scuff up that bait by like messing up the scales or putting a gouge in it with your knife. Okay, so I've got a blue label herring here. I'm gonna lay it down in the miter box. It's on the king side forward, so the head is facing king. Now, sharp knife, really important. Also, it's good to make like one or two clean slices. One slice is best. So, you know, don't be sort of gnawing at it the whole time and creating all these like different angles, but one slice right down is ideal. 
So then you'll have something like this, sort of creates a, you know, an angle on it. So it's important to use the tip of your knife to pull out the entrails. You don't want that to foul the way it spins. So you basically kind of stick the tip in and then just really delicately kind of motion outward and they should fall right out. Okay, so now we take our cut plug and we have a two hook rig here. And I actually like rigging this up very simple. So all I'll do is I'll take the top hook and I'm gonna hook it basically right through the middle, but I'm gonna favor the forward side. So whatever side is most forward leaning, the forward edge there, I'm gonna go just to that side. And what I'll do is I'll just hook, hook this hook right through, just like that. It's almost right down the center, except just favoring the forward side. And then I'll let the other hook dangle. And I'll wanna dangle that right around the tip of the, uh, of the herring, right at the end. So I'm adjusting this hook as we speak. There we go, right towards the bottom. And then that's a, that's a cut plug. And when you, you got to put it in the water and sort of drag it along, check to make sure that it's spinning. And it's just as simple as that. So the fish will, the, the salmon will come up and grab it. You might get it on the top hook. You might get them on the back hook, but either way, that's a deadly presentation. So this can be trolled behind a flasher, uh, just like I showed before, or it can actually be used just behind a banana weight. So some people use like a six ounce banana weight and then take, you know, a three or four foot leader uh, to then a cut plug like this. So here's an example of the two hook rig. These are really easy to pick up in stores. They're pretty inexpensive. This happens to be gamakatsu. This is a, a four aught, five aught, which means the top hook will be a four aught, the bottom a five aught. Uh, this is a slip tie rig, so it's nice that that upper hook will, will slide up and down. So if you're trying to get the herring distance just right, uh, it's adjustable, which is helpful. And this is 30 pound test. 30 pound test is a really nice, uh, nice test to use. I mean, that's what I caught a 43 pound king on and uh, I catch a lot of fish on these as well. Every so often I will bump it up to a, to a 40 pound test style. I'll actually, uh, I have some that I, I tie up myself. Here's an example of that. So sometimes during like the salmon derby or if it's really tough, tough conditions where it's really wavy and putting a lot of pressure on those fish, sometimes I will go to a, to a 40 pound test just so we're not breaking any fish off. Um, and when I do tie them myself, sometimes I'll actually use these uh, gamakatsu big river hooks. So these are a popular hook uh, from a, a number of different salmon fishermen, but you'll see they've got a real wide gap. And so I find that the you know, the hookup ratio, to, the hookup to landing ratio actually ends up being really, really good with these hooks. Um, so often you stick them and then they don't come off. So, so I like using those with, uh, with kind of my hand tied rigs, but I have absolutely no problem using the ones that you can just pick up in any store. They work great as well. And when I'm tying my own salmon leaders, I'm a real big fan of the Seaguar STS Salmon. So I like this, it's a fluorocarbon. It has enough abrasion resistance that you're not breaking them off because if it gets nicked on a tooth. Uh, and then also it's somewhat stiff. It's firm and such that when it's sitting behind that flasher, it's actually whipping. So if you have a real limp line, then the bait's not gonna get the full benefit of the flasher. But if you have a little more firmness with a fluorocarbon leader, uh, you can get a little more action out of that flasher, which can often trigger a strike. Uh, just another tip from a terminal tackle perspective. So a, uh, a flasher will have two sides, kind of a thick end and a thin end. You always want to run the thin end closest to the main line. And so the thick end runs trails behind, and that's what sort of generates that, that whip. Um, it should have a swivel on each side. And so this is going to go to the main line because this is the thin end. You see there's a swivel there. Swivels are really important when you're trolling, especially with a flasher. They avoid twists. Um, so I can't recommend strongly enough getting really good swivels, good ball bearing swivels. They're worth their weight in gold. Uh, you'll spend hours and hours and hours untangling knots if you don't get good swivels. But anyway, uh, the the, on the thin side of the flasher, there's going to be a swivel that goes to the main line. Come back to the thick side of the flasher. There's going to be another swivel. Some are different. Some will have like a um, kind of a wire swivel that'll open up. Others will just be sort of a fixed one. However it is, I like to take that to another really high quality ball bearing swivel. I tie a, a uni knot there and then come all the way down. That uni knot will have probably five, six wraps at least. 
on mono, it'll have 10 on uh, braid, but we're talking mono here. So at least six wraps on that uni knot, and then all the way down to what I just showed you before. There's that two hook rig and, uh, and then the clip. Well, you've heard me say this before, but it is absolutely imperative that you have razor sharp hooks. And so whether you use a hook sharpener and just kind of sharpen your hooks up before you start trolling, or if you switch them out, if the hooks are getting kind of rusty and they will rust, like this is a really tough environment up here in Southeast. That salt water, everything's always moist. It's really hard to get things dry. Uh, so rust and corrosion will happen. That's part of the process. Just cut those hooks off, throw them out and get yourself a pack of these and just toss some new hooks on there before you start trolling. It's so worth the investment of like a couple bucks uh, to, to know that when you hook into that king, your hooks are going to be in good shape. It's going to really stick it and stick it hard so that you can get it all the way to the boat. Definitely don't cheap out on hooks. Razor sharp hooks are really, really, really important. Well, if everything in the ocean will eat a herring, then you know what? By extension, almost everything in the ocean will eat a hoochie. These hoochies will actually imitate herring. So a hoochie is basically nothing more than just a, a rubber squid skirt. So it's a rubber a rubber tube that has these little, uh, these little legs that dangle, and they come in all different uh, colors. So I typically, when I'm trolling for salmon, I'm using like four and a half or five inch hoochies, which this is, this happens to be sort of a green chartreuse pattern. Uh, but they do come in some slightly smaller sizes and some slightly bigger sizes as well. Uh, and I run them the same way I do as a, as a herring with one of these two hook rigs. Although it's a little different in the sense that I run them shorter. So I mentioned that herring, it's, it's the star of the show. It it's, can benefit from that wide wobble of the flasher. With a, with a hoochie, we actually want it to be shorter. So this is only gonna be a two to three foot leader. And that's because the hoochie itself uh, is probably a little less desirable than a herring. So what it needs is the, is the flash. It needs the whip of the, of the flasher. So this flasher is gonna whip it around and that shorter leader is gonna create a really violent action such that these tails, these little tentacles are gonna dangle everywhere. And that's gonna create a really awesome, attractive uh, bait that, that salmon absolutely love. Okay, so the terminal tackle on the hoochie setup, is gonna be the exact same. So the thin side of the flasher goes to the main line, come down, high quality swivel. It's gonna be a shorter leader this time, just in that uh, two to three foot range so that it can benefit from really that whipping motion that the flasher gives. But let's take a closer look at, at sort of the action end here. So what you've got here is the, is the hoochie, that squid skirt. You'll end up, uh, some will have a hole in them already. Some you'll actually have to just cut a little hole there so that you can feed it down the line. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull it back to show you what else is sitting under there. So I'm pulling the, the hoochie back. And what you see here is I've got a tinsel skirt. So these tinsel skirts come in a variety of different thicknesses and colors. So experiment with some different ones to see what's working well. But then I also have a bead here. Some people might be like, hey, why do you have a bead there? Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's actually really important to space that out. And apologies, there's a float plane going over me right now. So hopefully you can still hear me. But when, I'll, when I put this all back together, Take a look at this upper hook. The upper hook is right there. If I didn't have that bead in place, the upper hook would be like right up on top here. And it would actually sort of mess with the action of the hoochie, but then it would also not give me the best chance of hooking a fish. So the fish is gonna come up and bite it. So I don't want the hook to be stuck way at the front like this. I wanna create that spacing that allows the hook to sit back far enough such that you know the upper hook is about mid bait and then the bottom hook you're gonna want towards the end of the bait. So that, those beads are really important. They can really save you from, uh, you know, like I said, fouling the action and then also uh, potentially missing fish that you could otherwise be hooking. Hey, one benefit of hoochies is that they come in just a ton of different colors and sizes. It can really give you lots of good options and they're actually really quick and easy to switch out. So you can try lots of different hoochie and flasher color combinations. So you can get kind of dialed in on a pattern pretty quick. That's one benefit of a hoochie, just the versatility of how quickly you can try new things and change up different color patterns. 
One thing I like to do with hoochies as well is to add some scent to them. So I've got a couple of these different herring scents. I tend to like using herring because obviously it's emulating a herring, but you know, here's one from Procure. Here's a super gel. That stuff's really sticky, so that works well. Here's Polsky's. They've got a fire gel herring. I've got another one called Smelly Jelly that's in a herring flavor. So adding some of that and just sort of rubbing it right into the hoochie and right into that tinsel skirt uh, can really work wonders. It can help trigger a strike. So herring or hoochie, which one do I prefer and why? Uh, honestly, I like them both and I'd use them both all the way throughout the season. So, you know, I think the herring is about the most natural bait you could be using. And so sometimes on the, the tougher bite, especially with those kings, it's often a little slow at the beginning of the, uh, of the terminal fishing season. I'll often be starting with a herring. Um, like I said, some different sizes, different color brine, et cetera. Uh, but, but I'm certainly not afraid to run like a herring on one side and a hoochie on the other. I've been, there's been plenty of times where even when I'm king fishing, I'll pick up the kings on the hoochies as opposed to the herring. So, so I have a lot of confidence in a herring, especially when it's a tough bite. Uh, but there are some real benefits to, uh, to the hoochies as well. So I mentioned the fact that you can kind of swap them out, a lot of different color patterns between the, the hoochie color and then the, the flasher color. You also have a 100% guarantee that you're fishing. So whereas like I mentioned the idea of like if you're using a cut plug, you're kind of hoping that you have the spin right. If you're using a herring clip, you're more confident that that spin is right. But if you're using a hoochie, you're real confident that you're fishing. So something has to go very wrong for you not to be uh, fishing effectively. So that's always really good. Plus, I think uh, I tend to prefer fishing hoochies when I'm fishing faster, which I'll get into some speed in a little bit. But um, but the fact you can really power troll a hoochie, you can kind of rip that through at a higher speed, especially when you're trolling for cohos. Whereas if you're ripping a, a, a herring through, it creates a very unnatural action. You know, a natural herring doesn't just sort of whip around like that. Um, and sometimes that can foul the bait. Whereas a hoochie, when it's whipping around like that, you know it's gonna continue to fish, you know it's not gonna get fouled, and often that can trigger a strike. Oh, and one other benefit of the hoochies is actually that they're cost effective. So herring can get quite expensive, especially if you're trying lots of different sizes, uh, different color brines, etc. So you can quickly get to an expensive freezer full of herring. Whereas hoochies, you can catch fish again and again and again and again, and they'll just keep fishing and keep catching. Well, color can make a big difference in terms of your salmon presentation. And as I've mentioned, like there's a lot of different subcomponents that each have their own unique color options. So the amount of combinations that you could put together becomes potentially limitless. Uh, and for some, that can be actually really frustrating. It's just this maze of options. Where do you start? How could you possibly get at the, you know, the best possible combination? So what I like to do is really hone in on, you know, three basic color setups. So I found that these three color setups really work well all season long. And so any given day, a specific color could really outshine another. But generally speaking, these three patterns work for me uh, throughout the season. So I'm talking for king trolling and for cohos. These color patterns also work for both herring setups and hoochies. The first pattern I like is pink and purple. So in any combination, these flashers will often have, you know, hues of pink and purple, often with some kind of a metallic shine to it as well. And what I'll do is I'll actually pair that with like a purple, purple pink or a kind of a, a, a glittery uh, hoochie, or I can use a similar, like maybe a blue brined herring with, uh, with a flasher like this. That, that pink purple combo is often really deadly. The next color pattern I really like is green and chartreuse. So kings and cohos really love green, you know, so whether it's kind of a deep green with some metallic or, or a lighter green, which then kind of gets towards the, towards the chartreuse uh, end of the spectrum, which is a little bit brighter and more vibrant. These just tend to be really great colors. Um, you know, this is what I caught that 43 pound king on. You know, it was kind of a chartreuse, has a green hue with some metallic on it. Um, again, you can kind of pair it up. So there's that chartreuse head, the uh, herring head, with that, that greenish chartreuse color there. And then similarly, I think this is the one that I showed. We've got a green, sort of a deep green flasher with then a, you know, a green and chartreuse hoochie as well. 
So again, just kind of mixing up those color combos, but, but keep, when I keep it in the same color family, I'm often getting uh, really good results. Uh, the last color pattern you definitely shouldn't leave the dock without is actually white. Believe it or not, like all the different colors up there on the wall at the store, the different color flashers, a white flasher is actually a really effective tool. So a white flasher with a herring, or what I like is actually a white on white. So like a white flasher or a, or a variant of white. So this is called cop car. It has kind of that almost like darkest sh silvery hue with a little bit of black, but mostly white. But run that with a, uh, with a white hoochie. So you can see there's a white hoochie there on, on this white flasher with metallic. You've got, you've got white there. Uh, from talking to different anglers, it, it, this is really trying to emulate a, uh, a squid, from what I understand. So, so those salmon do eat squid. There's schools of squid down there. And when you get this big white flash, and then you get, you know, kind of a little, a little uh, squid-looking thing going behind it, apparently that looks like a school of squid, and then one, one uh, kind of straggling squid that the salmon then just comes up and, and attacks. So... Even though you may have like thousands of dollars of different colors of options in your boat, um, never overlook something as simple as white on white. Sometimes that can be an absolute killer. Like most of you, I have flashers of sort of every make and model, but there's three specific features that I like, especially on these Pro Troll flashers that I thought I'd point out. Uh, one is any kind of UV or glow. So those are really attractive, uh, especially at the deeper depths to you know, triggering a strike. So anything with UV or glow is, is, is a bonus for me. Um, another one is this agitator fin. So you can see some flashes will have this, some won't. But the ones that do, you can actually, you control them at a slower speed. So it will whip around at a slower speed because it has that, um, that fin to be able to kind of generate that, that whip. That comes into handy, especially when trolling for kings. Kings like it a little bit slower, so the fact that you can achieve a slower speed and still get action on it is, uh, is really helpful. And then the last piece would be this E-chip. So the Pro Troll uh, versions uh, of flashers, these 11 inches, many of them will have these E-chips, which, which creates kind of a, a clicking noise that, that salmon tend to like. So again, there's not gonna be sort of one silver bullet that's gonna be the reason why you definitely catch a fish, but just sort of stacking the odds in your favor and understanding how some of these features can help you, uh, it definitely makes sense to pay attention to. So we talked about how to find a premium salmon spot, talked about some premium salmon baits. Now let's talk about a premium tide. Well, if you live in Southeast Alaska or if you ever visited here, you know that the tides can be really extreme. So they can go up and down by as much as 20 feet or more uh, in just one tide cycle. So given all of that water moving, that is often uh, really important for understanding what's gonna trigger a strike. So with the caveat that anything can happen at any tide cycle because it's fishing, uh, there are some sort of probabilities that I like to, to hone in on. Uh, I tend to find that the salmon are more willing to strike around a tide turn. So whether that's that high tide turn or whether that's the slack low, uh, that tends to be a really good time. That transition period as that tide is turning often will trigger strikes. Another dynamic I really like is actually fishing an incoming tide. So if you're able to fish that low tide turn and time permitting, you have time to kind of fish the, the entire incoming tide cycle as it rises up to that high, to that flood high, that can be really good. You know, the logic there is that, you know, as all that water is rushing in, more fresh fish are coming. So there may be some fish sort of already in the area, some schools of salmon nearby, but with that inflow of, of sort of fresh water, there's a chance that that's bringing new waves of fish. And some of those new waves of fish might be more willing to strike than perhaps fish that have been staging in an area for a while. The bite timing within a tide cycle is actually really important to pay attention to because sometimes that pattern can play out for multiple tide cycles. And what I mean by that is if, for instance, if the fish are biting, let's just say two hours before the high tide, there's a good chance that either the next high tide or maybe even for the next few days, two hours before the high tide could be a really hot time to fish. You might learn about that yourself because you happen to be fishing. You might learn about it from talking with others, but really pay attention to that because I have seen it play out again and again where the bite will be absolutely dead for the rest of the tide cycle except for some window. And there's not a silver bullet around that. It can be even an outgoing tide, like a mid outgoing tide. For some reason, 
you know, multiple days in a row can be a great time uh, at a certain spot. So this gets very sort of spot specific, but it is definitely worth paying attention to because it can be boom or bust. It can be absolutely nothing, a total wasteland until at this spot at this time, everything turns on and those salmon just decide to strike. And that brings me to my next point, and it's always be seeking information. So we are all learning out here every day. Nobody is an expert at this stuff. And so the more information that you're armed with, the better chance you have of, of really getting on a bite. Again, anyone can luck into a fish any given day, but typically speaking, sort of the more, the more data you've got, the better chance you have of lining the uh, variables up in your favor. And so, you know, in terms of guidance around just learning more and getting more real-time information, I would just say talk to fishermen. So walk the docks, like talk to other anglers who are out there on the docks who might be at the fillet table. If you're out on the water, ask how people are doing. Be observant, pay attention, bring your binoculars. If you see people hooking up, take note of that. When was it? Where was it? Uh, if you have a conversation with them on the water, you might get a sense of a specifically kind of what depth they were in or maybe what they were using, depending on what they're willing to, to share with you. You know, if, you, if you're on the docks in Juneau, I know there's creel surveys, the fishing game does surveys, so they're constantly asking people, you know, what they caught, where they caught it, and what they caught it on, this type of thing. You know, there's some local stores as well. So I know Sportsman's Warehouse and others will have actually fishing reports. Uh, and again, I mentioned sort of some of those fishing game resources online, like that interactive tool that can kind of give you, get you pointed in the right direction. So I would say like, Use as many different sources of information as possible and then combine it all when you're out there on the water to give yourself an advantage. I get a lot of questions about my, uh, my salmon rod and reel setup, so I thought I'd just do kind of a quick walkthrough. I'm a big fan of these Lama Glass trolling rods, you know, and that's, that's not really going way out on a limb. They're, they're pretty much known for, for making a really quality trolling rod. Uh, but I've got this Lama Glass composite uh, Redline trolling series and it's worked out really well. So these, I've got a whole set of them and I actually just ordered a couple of their, their, their newer series, but also in that, uh, in that red line model, uh, 10 and a half feet. So I like that longer rod that can really load up into the, uh, into the downrigger. I mean, these are just sturdy rods. They really work well with, um, with the heavy load that I put on them here in the kind of a tough Southeast Alaskan environment. This, this rod's rated for uh, one to eight ounces. So just to give you a sense, it's kind of a, uh, a medium moderate action uh, and and they're absolutely perfect so i i troll these uh, for kings for cohos and everything in between what i've got this loaded up here it's with a shimano takoda a 600 model with a line counter so you see the line counter that's really important for trolling to understand uh, how far that fish is away such that you can make sure you're doing the, the proper network and, and prep and engine maneuvering that you need to do and then I, I use a, a 25 or a 30 pound uh, Maxima green, which is a great, a great line. I prefer a mono line. So this is a, again, a hotly contested uh, topic, but I actually, some folks will, some folks will prefer braid. Um, and I, I like mono. I think mono gives you a little extra stretch, which will often help avoid pulling hooks. So it gives it a little extra stretch such that as that fish is thrashing around, you're not gonna pull the hook. Um, so at the end of the day, I really like mono. I've caught tons and tons of fish on that, and I, I don't think I'll ever switch away from mono on my trolling rod. And I've been really impressed with the uh, Shimano Takoda, the performance of this reel. Super smooth. It's got kind of this oversized handle, which is really nice for, for battling fish, especially if you're in, out there in the, kind of the waves and the chop. And the, uh, the drag is really, really smooth, which is, is really important. So often you get a big fish on a big king or, or kind of a acrobatic coho you need that drag to work every single time any hesitation in the drag can result in either a pulled hook or even a broken line so the fact that this drag is just so silky smooth is a huge benefit in terms of uh, landing the fish that you do hook yeah i mentioned that mono provides a little bit of extra stretch to help avoid sort of a pulled hook or a broken line you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that 10 and a half foot rod. This rod that has definitely enough backbone, a nice heavy backbone, but also enough sort of limber play such that any acrobatic salmon is definitely going to get kind of the flex it needs as opposed to just getting kind of ripped, ripped through the water. Um, all of that in parallel 
works really well. So that limber rod, you've got the, the drag that is just sort of silky smooth and really seamless, and then also the mono line that gives you a little extra stretch. All of that leads to just more and more fish in the net. You know, I, I just mentioned sort of the benefits of that rod, the reel, and the line all put together. I guess another tip would just be, let that gear do its job. So I see a lot of folks who are trolling and it, it looks like they've hooked a bass when they, when they get a salmon on. They're just sort of ripping. They, I mean, they're going like 100 miles an hour, reeling as fast as they can, making all this jerking motion. And nine times out of 10, they pull that hook and that fish is off almost as quick as it got on. So the idea with, you've got this perfectly selected gear that is just perfectly made for every thrash that salmon's gonna do, those deep runs, you know, those, those sort of acrobatic jumps if it's a coho. So let that, let that limber rod do its job. Let that mono, like that flex benefit you. Let that smooth drag play it out and really think about just kind of slow and steady. Slow and steady is the key when you're reeling in a fish that's been hooked uh, trolling. Slow and steady. You don't want to be sort of jerking erratically or pulling hard. It's all about sort of low and slow, nice and steady, and get that fish to the boat, get that fish in the net. Speaking of the net, Let's talk about that a little bit. This is one of the most sort of overlooked aspects of catching a salmon, especially kings. I have seen so many fish lost right at the boat, right at the net. I've been you know, guilty of a few of these myself as well, uh, which is all to say, it really makes sense to think through in advance a really good netting strategy. So first of all, whenever you're salmon fishing, you should assume you're gonna catch one which means you should have your net ready and available at all times. Don't have your net tangled up somewhere in the corner of the boat, snagged on some lures or some flashers or this or that. You need to have it readily available. So like I tend to prefer, I keep it on the top of the boat. I keep it right there, such that someone's on, and you've seen this a hundred times in my videos, I can do one of these and bam, have the net. If you're not out in a boat, if you're on the shore, still position the net such that it has easy access for once you get that fish on. Don't wait till you get a fish on to start fumbling around for the net. So now you've got a fish on, you have the net because it was easily accessible. The next thing to think about is get in position. And this will vary based on every different circumstance, but if you've got multiple people in the boat, you should have somebody to net the fish. So that person should get in position. So this often looks like getting to the corner of the boat, kind of the back corner, or actually hop on the transom so that they can get kind of the farthest possible reach. So we're talking like right here at the corner or all the way back to the transom. And then the fisher person can step back. So that's a really long salmon rod they've got. They can kind of step back and still play the fish. Whereas the net person can stand right here in position. And you should always know how close the fish is. I said the line counter on the reel is really important. This is exactly why. If you watch my videos, you'll hear us constantly communicating. 40 feet, 35 feet, 20 feet, 15 feet, almost here, flasher. So you're constantly having a sense of how close that fish is such that the net person should never be surprised that the fish is there. The net person should be there just expecting to scoop it right up. So let's talk about scooping that fish up because this is one of the most common mistakes I see out there on the water and it is just an absolute heartbreaker. It is so frustrating to watch people do almost everything right. You've, you've moved so many mountains to sort of get on the water, get all your gear fishing correctly, finally get a king salmon strike, fight that fish all the way to the boat, and then for it to get off because of a Bosch net job, it's a travesty and it shouldn't happen, but it does and I guarantee you I'll, I'll see it next week when I'm out there on the water. So please, please pay attention to this net point. The person netting the fish should scoop the fish up quickly and precisely. The net should not be dragged along in the water. So typically I'm right-handed. If I'm the net person, my right hand's gonna go on the very end here. My left hand's gonna go far up here. I actually have one of these bungees to hold the bag of the net against the pole. And that's so that the bag doesn't drag in the water. And then once the fish is in the net, the weight of the fish pulls this open and then the bag drops. So I have to give a big shout out to a fan who uh, met me on the dock one day just to give me one of these. It's a really cool little invention. I've been using it ever since. I think everyone should have one. 
Okay, so I'm the net person here. And again, right hand to the back of the net, I'm right-handed. Uh, left hand as far forward as you can do. And then you're gonna wanna put your right hand up in the air, but don't touch the net on the water. If you drag that net around in the, in the water, first of all, it's gonna spook the salmon. Secondarily, you can, net, you can get the net hooked on the, on the hook. So if, if, there's a, if there's a hook flailing around and you've got the net dragging along in the water, there's a reasonable chance that you're gonna actually get the hook caught on the net before the fish is actually in the net, which is an awful outcome. Almost immediately it'll break the line, the fish will get off and you'll be really frustrated. So right hand on the back, left hand up here, hold it up. And, and only when you see the fish close enough that's when you take a stab. And I like to think about it as a stab. You wanna stab it downward and outward. So you stab down in the water and out, and then pull it up. So stab down and out and up. But you don't wanna get this in the water and start chasing the fish with it. So you see people all the time dragging it along like this. The fish is gonna either like, the hook will get caught on the side of the net and break off or the fish will just go berserk because it sees the net and you're just, it's hard to move a net through the water. There's a lot of drag. You see how hard that is? Really hard to do. So what you need to do is nail it on the first time. Stab it down and through and then pull it up. You'll catch them every time. Now that's the easy part when you have somebody to net for you. I do a lot of trolling by myself, solo trolling. So obviously I am the net person at that point. So it becomes even more important that I have the net staged correctly. You'll see it staged on top. Once I get a fish, you'll often see me, I'll put the net to the back of the boat right there, such that I can fight that fish, fight that fish. And then whenever I get the fish close enough where I can see it and it's within scoopable range, what I'll do, throw the net up, and then again, I'll go for that downward stab. It's gonna be one-handed because I've got a left, uh, my, my rod in my left hand, but with one hand, still go to try to stab down and out. That stab down and out is really key. And uh, go back and look at a couple of my other videos, you'll see that same type of thing. Even when I'm solo trolling, I still try to make that stabbing action such that it's not dragging the net in the water. I get a lot of questions about my downrigger gear, so I'll give you a little overview about what I'm running. So I've got two Canon Digitrol 10s, and I've really liked their performance over the last few years. Um, it's a feature heavy unit. Uh, some of those features I use more, some less, uh, but all in all, I would definitely buy them again. I don't know if they make this exact unit still. Uh, I got this probably about five years ago, so I think they might've moved on to newer generations, but I think the features are still worth talking about. So what I appreciate most out of these units is the really strong engine that goes both down quickly, but also up quickly. It uh, has a really strong and reliable auto up feature. So anytime you get a fish on, you can quickly auto up. I mean, especially like during the derby, you got coho, coho doubles going on. Being able to, you know, or if I'm trolling for King solo and I need to, you know, get the gear out of the way so that I can land the fish, that auto up feature is, is huge. Um, so another feature that I use occasionally is auto cycling. So you can actually have the downrigger on any predetermined cycle go up and down. Uh, I, can, I can move it up and down by any number of feet. Usually I keep it small, like a one or a two foot interval. Um, and then it can do that every five seconds, every 30 seconds, whatever you want to set it to. Uh, I find that helpful in terms of just throwing something a little different at the fish, especially if there's a, a slow bite. So anything to just be a little different, give it a slightly different look. Uh, that can be cumbersome if you want to do it more than just a couple feet because the rod is in the holder there. So you really have to tend to the rod. If you're gonna do it by more than a couple feet, it obviously needs more when it goes deeper. And then when it comes up, you need to reel that slack up. So, you know, that maintenance tends to be uh, why I don't use it that much. And when I do use it, I'll only do it up by a foot or two, such that I don't have to touch the rod. The rod can just sort of flex and bend to those different depth changes. One other feature this has that I uh, don't use is, is a bottom tracking feature. So these have their own transducer. So I can tell this to track, you know, three feet or five feet from the bottom, and it'll actually adjust the depth dynamically based on, on how deep it is. Uh, I find that based on the use case I have, like especially if I'm trolling for cohos, I could be in 800 feet of water, so that's not as useful. And when I'm trolling for kings, those kings are often not orienting to the very bottom. 
they're orienting around bait fish and other structures. So I think that that feature is sort of more prevalent for the Great Lakes region, some of the lake trout fishing use cases where, you know, the difference between boom or bust can be, are you within a few feet of the bottom? So, you know, it has that feature and functionality. I just haven't been using it a lot here in Southeast Alaska. Another feature I really like on this is the positive ion control. So I am by no means a, uh, a biologist, but I understand that boats can give off negative energy and that can be bad for fishing. And so the downrigger aims to mitigate that by, by using sort of positive energy to kind of block it out. Um, I just use the default setting. So some people get very technical and, and they adjust the amount of positive ion control. I just keep it at the default. Uh, and I've always found that it's done really well and I tend to have an outsized catch ratio because of it. Hey, one other nice feature of these downriggers, they have what's called water zero, which means that you can put the ball down in the water, uh, which would usually be three feet, maybe even four feet down. And then you can program it to just call that zero. And why that's important is because when you auto up, it'll auto up all the way to wherever zero is. And you want zero to be down at the water. You don't want zero to be all the way up here. Because if, if you auto up and zero is right at the tip of your downrigger, that weight's going to come flying out of the water, which is really bad. Because then that weight's going to smash the side of your boat once you start rocking. So to avoid that smashing of the side of the boat, that weight flailing around, that water zero function can really help you out. I run a 12-pound Cannonball. It's actually Cannon brand. Uh, I like the ball that has the, uh, the, the plastic coating on it such that uh, you're not always having to get lead all over your hands and all over your boat bashing around. So this sort of, it's more of like a soft rubberized coating, uh, I think really helps. And then of course, some extra metallic on there can never hurt as well. So these have treated me really well over the years. And again, in the, uh, in the 12 pound model. So in terms of downrigger clips, this is actually where I depart from the Canon brand. So I actually choose these Scotty downrigger clips. They're, uh, they're called the Power Grip Plus. I like the 48 inch model. So 48 inches for me is just right. So they make some that are shorter, some that are longer. But I also prefer the version that snaps onto your line as opposed to running the, uh, the, the line right off of the downrigger ball. And let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, so I've attached the 12 pound downrigger ball to the, uh, to the clip at the very end of the line. And now I've got this, uh, this Scotty downrigger clip, which will actually attach a couple of feet above the ball, just like that. About maybe a foot or 18 inches is probably what I like to do. I actually like running the gear above the downrigger ball, just in case I would ever run aground. I would rather just snag off the downrigger ball than all of the gear. Here's a closer look at the downrigger clip. So again, this is what attaches to the downrigger line just above the ball. And then this is the business end of the clip. This is what attaches to your line. So you pinch on this side and you see it opens up. You put the line in here. And the deeper you put the line, the harder it is to pop the clip. So if you're, if you're fishing for king salmon and it's kind of tough seas and you want to make sure it doesn't accidentally pop out, you can put it way, way in and it'll be harder to pull out. Or maybe you're fishing for cohos and it's kind of calm, you know, aim for like middle of the clip. Uh, I don't have very many uh, sort of false alerts with these, which is why I love them so much because they're really sturdy. So there's nothing more frustrating than your line popping the clip without getting a fish. I find that those, that happens sort of few and far between. Usually if that happens, it's because some huge wave came by and maybe pulled the rods really hard, that type of thing. So anyway, you basically put the line in there and then you're good to go. So how far do I run my gear behind the downrigger? Uh, everyone will have their own answer to this question, but for me, uh, 15 feet is about my average. So I will, I will sort of get that rig all set up. I'll have the flasher towards the top of the rod and then I'll just let it go out behind the boat about 15 feet. And I can see it on the line counter. So the line counter says 15 feet, I lock it in, and then I grab the line and I pinch it and put it right in there, such that it'll hold it right behind, right behind the downrigger line. So the clip will hold your line and your bait will be 15 feet behind. And once the salmon comes up and strikes your bait, then it'll pop the clip, which means that the line 
will disengage from this clip and then you're tight to the rod. While I typically troll my baits 15 feet back from the downrigger line, there are cases where I'll go even farther back. So sometimes when I'm fishing in shallow water, especially in some of the terminal harvest areas, the terminal king areas, sometimes I'll be fishing in like 10 feet, 15 feet of water. And in those cases, I actually will go back farther. I'll go 30 or 40 feet back behind the boat. So back behind the downrigger line. The point there is that I don't really want to be trolling with my like flasher within sight right behind the boat. 15 feet in that case has me sort of just right behind the boat in that shallow water. I tend to think that when you're in the real shallow water to get farther back beyond the boat is, uh, is, is, a, is an advantage. And so the, in those cases, I'll go you know 30 or even 40 feet back. Uh, and I have plenty of examples of when I make that switch, I immediately hook up. Okay, let's talk trolling depth. Like I said, most folks will be targeting either kings or cohos, so I'll keep those two fish in mind. Typically, on average, kings will be deeper than cohos. So this especially plays out with fishing for feeder kings. You know, if I'm fishing for feeder kings, it's probably down that 70, 80, anywhere to like probably 110, 120. So deliberately fishing deeper to target those feeder kings. Now I mentioned that preference for deep water in the context of feeder kings, because some of the terminal fisheries actually sort of debunk this point. There are terminal fisheries, especially like in the Juneau area, I know of some down by Petersburg, where, uh, where these king salmon are caught in relatively shallow water. I just gave the example of fishing in 10 or 15 feet of water uh, for kings, trolling way back behind the boat. So, um, so those terminal fisheries can be a little nuanced. There are some shallow water opportunities. There are certainly some deep water opportunities as well. And that brings us to the cohos. So they are a fun acrobatic fish that are full of surprises. So I have caught cohos um, in the engine wash, which is to say that I've pulled my, my downrigger up and a coho has just come up and grabbed it right off the surface. So they can be as shallow as right off the surface, but I can also find them as deep as like a hundred feet. So I've been fishing for kings down deep and actually consistently caught coho in that like 90, 100 foot range. But if I'm going out targeting coho, well, I'm probably targeting a range of like probably 20 to probably 60 feet is a good start. If I'm running two rods, maybe I'll do a, maybe I'll do 40 and 60 just to get it going. Um, maybe I'll, I'll come up to a 30, maybe go down to a 65 or 70 and just sort of mix up some different depth ranges until you kind of figure out, you know, what depth range they're biting at. Once you do, then kind of hone in on that. If you can get multiple bites at a certain depth range, follow that. But then never be afraid to mix it up. If it's starting to slow down, you know, pull one up to 20, pull one up to 15, put one down a little deeper. Constantly be kind of changing some variables to figure out how you can set it up in your favor. And for me, any uh, pinks or chums that are caught, they're sort of bycatch anyway. So, you know, I'm often catching those as bycatch when I'm coho fishing in some of that relatively shallower water, anywhere from like 30 to, you know, 60 feet. And although I did say that the feeder kings tend to be deeper, every year I'll catch some bycatch feeder kings um, in some shallower water. So like if I'm coho fishing and I've got a rod at maybe like 35 and maybe one at 50, I could just as easily pick up a feeder king there as well. So those feeder kings will come up and eat in that shallower water, but I'm just saying, generally speaking, they'll tend to be deeper than the cohos. So trolling speed is really important when salmon fishing. So on average, kings will prefer a slower, wider wobble, and cohos will prefer a faster, tighter wobble. So it's worth understanding kind of the fish you're targeting and then how fast you want to be trolling. When I'm trolling for kings, I am trolling deliberately slow. So I'm anywhere from like as slow as a half mile an hour, anywhere up to like maybe like 1.7, 1.9 miles an hour. Uh, when I'm fishing for cohos, it can be like two miles an hour up to, I've caught them going five miles an hour before. You know, and while I just called out those speed ranges, I actually don't fixate on the actual number as much as I do sort of the angle on the line because there is a lot of current in Southeast Alaska. I mentioned sort of those tides. So there's always a lot of water moving, plus there can be wind. So if you get a tide moving, you've got a lot of water moving, you get sort of heavy current in a direction, plus wind. Uh, it's important to note that if your boat's moving really fast, you're gonna have to move fast to move the gear. 
Uh, and conversely, if you're going against wind and against the current, you can basically just sit there or go very slow and the gear will be ripping. So for me, it's more about how fast is that gear working as opposed to how fast is the sort of the GPS telling me that the boat's going. I mentioned the cohos like it fast. You know, one play that I really like to call sometimes is if I can ever get a following wind with a following current, which will really get the boat moving in an area that I know is like prime for, for salmon. So if I know that based on those migration patterns and based on sort of historical knowledge, that there's a long, long stretch where there's likely to be some schools of salmon, then what I will do is I'll just sort of troll across that like power trolling. I will sort of race. And if I've got the wind and the current behind me, I'll be trolling fast. It'll be, you know, four plus miles an hour. Uh, and I can cover a lot of ground and I love that. I love covering like a five or even a 10 mile stretch because I'm giving myself a chance to encounter all these different schools of coho. If I was faced the other direction, I'd barely be moving. I would be trolling, the gear would be ripping and I'd be looking at the shoreline seeing the exact same thing almost because it would just barely be making ground against all of that current and all of that wind. But when I turn it the other direction, I can cover an amazing amount of ground. And I love that dynamic. You're covering that ground and really giving yourself a chance to bump into a, a school of cohos. Hey, another tip to consider is there are other ways to catch salmon from a boat that aren't trolling. And so while I am mostly trolling, there are some occasions where I will stop and, for instance, cast spoons or spinners. If I see jumper salmon left, right, and center, and I'm doing no good trolling, sometimes I'll pull up into the shallows and start, start casting for them. Also, you, know, you can do what's called um, mooching, which is to say you can use sort of a, a banana weight or similar weight uh, and then sort of drop a, a cut plug herring down and work a very specific spot a little bit more deliberately. If you know there's a school of salmon in the area, you can kind of hyper target that exact spot as opposed to um, you know trying to troll all the way past and, and, and around and back. One other technique I'll use, if I know there's a school of salmon around at a specific depth range, I'll, uh, I'll stop trolling and I'll pull out what I call these little pencil jigs. They're basically like holographic herring. So this is three ounces, this is six ounces. And I'll toss that on one of my trolling rods and just start working them vertically up and down. So this is a really effective tactic, um, if you, especially if you know the fish are concentrated, everything in the sea eats a herring. So these herring sort of bit dancing around like that, that'll often trigger a strike. Trolling spoons can also be pretty effective. So while I'm not gonna go into detail, I will show you a few example spoons. So I like to troll spoons maybe four or five feet behind a flasher. These larger spoons, those are gonna be trolled for king salmon typically. And then the, the cohos will often go for these smaller spoons. Sometimes really, really small spoons. You'd be surprised at the big coho you can catch on just a, just a small spoon like that. So some people have asked me, does the weather impact salmon fishing in Southeast Alaska? You know, and I would say by and large, the tides are way more important than the weather. However, uh, rain can be your friend. So if you get a couple of days of like good, hard, steady rain, I would say that is creating sort of favorable conditions for salmon fishing. And the reason that is, is because, you know, all of that fresh water coming down, it's promoting more fresh water flow out of the streams and the rivers that those salmon have imprinted on. So it, it's pushing that fresh water out and it's essentially kind of sp spurring those fish that are returning towards that fresh water, it's spurring them to continue their run. So I think, you know, on balance, rain is a good thing and it's promoting sort of more fresh fish to continue to, uh, to run. And while I've talked a lot about trolling here, there's also a lot of casting opportunities. So you can cast from shore and actually have a ton of success for both kings and cohos. So typically this is using sort of a, you know, medium to heavy weight spinning setup, something in the six to seven foot range, and then casting spoons and spinners. So there's a lot of different spoons and spinners out there that work. Uh, any local store will have a bunch of them, but you know, flying seas are a good choice, uh, a crocodile spoon, little pixies, you know, um, you know, there's all kinds of really good options that'll work. And like I said, you can often find certain points that'll have access to deep water that'll be really deadly for, for casting for salmon. 
Well, we covered a lot of ground here. Hopefully you were able to find a tip or two here that'll be helpful the next time you're trying to catch salmon in Southeast Alaska. Uh, if you have any other sort of questions or comments, anything I didn't address or anything you'd like to see in a future video, feel free to, uh, to drop me a comment. I'm happy to always engage there. If you have other ideas of things that you'd think would be effective, I'm always open to chatting about those too. Always looking to learn and get more effective uh, out here fishing for salmon in, uh, in Southeast Alaska. So bye for now, tight lines, Thanks for tuning in, and we'll look forward to catching up with you next time.